Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to speak at this conference. Uh, it's a, a great honor. Um, so I hope you all can stay awake a wee bit <laughs> longer. <laughs> there is a bit of overlap, unfortunately, with uh, Stefan's presentation and mine, but I'll try and skip through the, the parts. So um, lymphomas, yes, uh, they represent 5% uh, of all cancers and approximately half of all hematological malignancies. You can essentially divide them into Hodgkin lymphomas and non-Hodgkin lymphomas. Um, and then, as Stefan said, you can divide the non-Hodgkin lymphomas into B, T, and NK uh, lymphomas. And then, uh, anatomically, you can divide them into those occurring in the lymph nodes or those occurring extranodally. And the ones which occur in and around the eye are all extranodal lymphomas. So, as Stefan mentioned, we use the WHO lymphoma classification. Um, this uh, you shouldn't really take for granted because many years ago, when I was going through medicine, I had to learn at least four or five different types of lymphoma classifications by rote and uh, didn't understand the differences between them, but it did cause tremendous difficulties in, in uh, conducting clinical trials across the globe. And so it was in the end of the 1990s uh, that the, a consensus was achieved and the WHO lymphoma classification was then published and has since been revised. And um, I um, became a consultant histopathologist in about 2002. And you can see that, uh, that in a very short space of time there have been revisions and this volume is increasing in size and size and size and the number of entities that we all have to know is a bit too demanding. But anyway, um, essentially you can then divide, you classify the lymphomas according to the clinical aspects, the histomorphological features, the immunophenotype, and then the genetic or the molecular alterations, which are typically chromosomal translocations. So when we look at the ocular lymphomas, um, we have the ocular nexal lymphomas, those occurring in the structures that Stefan described, and then we also have those occurring intraocularly. And um, they are all, when we subtype them according to the WHO lymphoma classification, then essentially you can say that the most common um, lymphoma occur occurring in the ocular nexa is the extranodal marginal zone B cell lymphoma, or MALT lymphoma for short, whereas the most common occurring intraocularly is the diffuse large cell B cell lymphoma. And then it's the reverse, so to say, uh, the second place is the diffuse large cell B cell lymphoma in the ocular nexa, and then the extranodal marginal uh, um, B cell lymphoma occurring most commonly in the choroid, but I'll just I'll go through that uh, very briefly. So you've seen this structure already. So B and T cells, where did we get the B from? Well, it actually came from the um, birth of Fabricius, and Fabricius was actually Hieronymus Fabricius and didn't come from Portugal. I tried my best to get him coming from Portugal. Actually came from Padua, so Martina Angie would be very happy with that. Um, and you can see that he was, um, you know, he described uh, the, the primary lymphoid organ in birds um, many years ago. And so the immature B cells, they arise in the bone marrow, uh, whereas the immature T cells, they arise in the thymus. But since we're talking predominantly about B cells, this is what I'll concentrate on. So they um, arise in the, uh, in the bone marrow, they uh, are naive, they haven't been to, exposed to antigen, they then pass into lymphoid tissue in the lymph node, in the spleen, or in the tonsils, or in the payers patches of the ileum, and, and then they're exposed to antigen, and they, they undergo what's called the germinal center reaction. And now this is a, a very torrent environment, approximately 90% of the B cells actually undergo apoptosis because they're proof red essentially for their degree of antigenicity and only those who emerge uh, uh, are termed memory B cells or uh, then go on to plasma, plasma cells. Um, so, sorry, my, there we go. And during this whole process, a number of molecular changes occur, uh, which I won't go into detail, but uh, somatic mutation occurs, there's an isotype switch, 
And so on the basis of this, when you're, you're tracing the development of B cells, you can look at their surface, the, uh, the markers expressed on their surface, you can look at the genetics occurring within the cells, and therefore you can dis essentially determine at what stage a lymphoma develops. And so this is the logic of the WHO lymphoma classification, whereby they suggest that the immature uh, Lympho lymphoblastic leukemias um, arise from the immature B cells, the mantle cells, uh, mantle cell lymphomas from the mantle cell, uh, the follicular lymphomas and the, germ uh, the diffuse large cell B cell lymphomas from the germinal center, and these from the so-called post-germinal uh, center B cells. So what does this all mean for the intraocular lymphomas? Well, um, looking at the vitreoretinal lymphomas, the, the vast majority are diffuse large cell B cell lymphomas. So I'm just going to very briefly just uh, go into some clinical aspects. So vitreoretinal lymphoma, a very rare tumor. However, when it occurs, it's very aggressive. It uh, presents often as a so-called masquerade syndrome. The patients present with a chronic uveitis, which doesn't respond to steroids. And they can sometimes simultaneously have um, CNS disease, which results in further symptoms, and, um, and then they can have simultaneous eye disease. So how the, is the diagnosis made? Well, usually through vitreoretinal surgeons who then either perform a, a vitrectomy um, or, or a subretinal aspiration. They send to us uh, these samples, which have to be worked up very carefully. And you see within them these uh, pleomorphic uh, cells. And since they're B cells, they express B cell antigens here, CD20, and have a very high proliferation rate. So how do we work them up? We receive the samples, we prepare the cytospins, we do immunohistochemistry, others do flow cytometry. This tends to be done in the, the States, um, but I think it's a uh, it's a matter of what experience your lab has. Um, some laboratories and clinics uh, use cytokine analysis, analysis, which I'll go on to. Also reserve some of the sample for molecular testing, which includes um, IgH-PCR and MYD88 mutation analysis, which I'll come back to. So the flow cytometry, um, it can be used on the liquid samples, can be done quite quickly. And you get the you have the gating of the samples. You get the CD20 positive cells, and then you can demonstrate monotypical or monoclonality using the kappa or the lambda. And then, if you've, you're suspecting that it's a T cell lymphoma, which are exceptionally rare, then you can also look at the various um, subtypes of the T cells. Um, these are the cytochrome kinds, which are used, uh, for example, in Paris and uh, in Bethesda, where they look at the interleukin-6, interleukin-10, and uh, interferon-gamma ratios. And uh, if the, it is raised, then this tends to indicate or provide evidence for the diagnosis of lymphoma. We use uh, IgH-PCR using biomed primers, uh, which uh, have been um, standardized. And you can use them on either liquids or on uh, formalin fixed paraffin embedded samples, not necessarily globes. And the beauty of the IgH PCR is that you can then look at the clones and follow the clones if a patient, as it happened in this case, develops a recurrence. So this was a 46 year old who had involvement of the eye, the brain simultaneously, and then unfortunately a recurrence in the opposite eye. The, the same clone could be demonstrated in all three locations with only slight um, base changes in the, in the uh, sequences. You have to be very careful with IgH-PCR because you can get pseudoclonality because you could hypothetically be uh, amplifying one single cell and sometimes these uh, samples contain very uh, small numbers of cells. And on the other hand, you can get oligoclones where because you've got a massive necrosis occurring in the background and so you, don't, you can't really amplify the cells. And you have to be careful when you do TCR, PCR because it's just you, that you can get inflam inflammation occurring in endophthalmitis and you can also get a pseudoclone. Something that really has advanced the field is the use of uh, MYD88 mutation analysis. So 70% of the vitreoretinal lymphomas have this mutation. And uh, when, you do, when you look for the MYD88 mutation, 
it requires a smaller amount of DNA than what is required for the IGH PCR. And so this, I guess, is a summary of the, the type of diagnostics. I guess flow cytometry, um, the, the interleukins can be used, and uh, the advantage of those, you can monitor the therapy um, and uh, the MID88 mutational analysis. Increasingly, people are producing bespoke and next generation sequencing panels. And a publication by Kenny and co workers suggests that you could have a next generation sequencing panel consisting of these three genes. Um, Bonsheim and co workers in Tübingen, and uh, we're presenting this actually this year at the hematopathology meeting, suggest you actually probably need a, a larger number of genes on, on the panel. And you can also look at the non-cellular component, um, and people have looking, been looking at the microRNAs, and it's been shown that um, if you use these four microRNAs, they're quite distinguishing in, uh, between inflammation and uh, the presence of a lymphoma. If you're lucky, the vitreoretinal surgeons will send you more material. They, they won't just send you liquid, they'll also send you some tissue, a chorioretinal biopsy, and I guess the advantage of that is that pathologists love playing with extra pieces of tissue and um, doing immunohistochemistry. And we did have the uh, opportunity to do that. Um, many years ago, we looked at uh, CNS lymphomas and vitreoretinal lymphomas, and you'll recognize that Justine Smith was involved in this uh, project. And we compared it with the peripheral diffuse large B cell lymphomas, and we looked at particular transcription factors and saw that they, the, the CNS and the vitreoretinal lymphomas, which are essentially cousins, very, very close cousins, um, they differ in their expression of the transcription factors compared to the systemic uh, diffuse large cell B cell lymphomas. Interestingly, also, they express particular chemokine receptors, which we think may explain to some extent why the CNS lymphomas and the vitreoretinal lymphomas stay within the CNS system. They hardly ever spread externally into the lymph nodes. And I also had the opportunity of looking at the somatic mutation pa pattern of the uh, vitreoretinal lymphomas and demonstrated that they were, had a massive number of mutations present within the, the, um, the variable region. And this was confirmed by another group. But essentially, this um, confirms where we think, the, at what stage of the differentiation, the, the tumor arises. So we think it is a post-germinal center. B cell, which has undergone massive number of hypermutations within the germinal center, and then um, um, pushed through as a, as a clone. So in 2000, 18 years ago, um, using gene expression profiling, Alice Day and co-workers, they demonstrated that you could subdivide the diffuse large cell B cell lymphomas into so-called ABC and GBC subtypes. Now, the, there is an, a, a clinical relevance to this uh, in that the ABC subtypes are very, very aggressive. So unfortunately, we haven't had sufficient material to do gene expression profiling on um, the vitreoretinal lymphomas. However, we have been able to use uh, uh, immunohistochemistry as surrogate markers. And the, I think it can be um, demonstrated that the vast majority of the vitreoretinal lymphomas are of ABC subtype, and hence explains why these tumors are very, very aggressive. And uh, this is just a breakdown showing yes, the, um, how they can be subdivided and the importance of this MYD88 mutation. So just to summarize vitreoretinal lymphomas, and I'm going to go on to, uh, briefly onto the other types of intraocular lymphomas. Um, these, these are high-grade B cell lymphomas. They have a, a particular mutation pattern. Uh, a translocation has been described in some, um, and it's, I think there's sufficient evidence to say that they are post-germinal center B cells. Um, come treatment, I'm going to not going to steal Kirby's show, to, uh, but uh, essentially it's a mixture of radiotherapy and chemotherapy. The prognosis, unfortunately, is poor. Uh, increasingly, rituximab has been added into the chemotherapy, and it's probably worth mentioning that we're 20 years, or 21 years now, since the, the discovery and introduction of rituximab into the clinic. And since then, a number of different types, modified types of anti-CD20 antibodies have been developed. Um, 
There are a whole range of other things on the horizon. Uh, these are still very much in, in the clinical trials. Uh, interestingly, MMID88 inhibitors uh, have been developed. Um, and there, of course, like er every other tumour, uh, there's the immunotherapy and the small inhibitors which are also being used. So just moving on to the other types of intraocular lymphomas, and these are even rarer than the vitreoretinal lymphomas. These are the choroidal lymphomas and the iridal lymphomas. So it's important to differentiate these because the choroidal lymphomas, they occur, as the, as the name says on the tin, um, in the choroid. They do not affect the retina. So this is the retina here. And typically, these, oh, sorry, this is uh, some clinical pictures. You can see the blood vessels of the retina. They're not obscured in any way. The pa the, these yellow patches are within the choroid. And here is a nucleated eye showing this is a massive infiltration of a choroidal lymphoma. And we have extraocular extension uh, posteriorly. And in some cases, you have it anteriorly as well. So these are low-grade B-cell lymphomas. They are like the lymphomas which occur in the, the conjunctiva. They arise um, not from the germinal center. They arise from the marginal zone. And they show a plasma cellular differentiation. And if you get a biopsy of these, they don't, this biopsy doesn't come from the vitreous. This biopsy comes from the choroid. And you can see that this is the size of an erythrocyte, and the lymphocytes are about the same size. So they're small cells. Um, they mark with B-cell antigens, and they have a very low proliferation rate. So they're low-grade B-cell lymphomas. They have no association with the brain. And uh, the patients tend to do well if they're treated with uh, low-dose radiotherapy. Since they're rare, we don't really know all that much about them. And so there are a lot of question marks, but it's it's assumed that they have similar translocations that occur in the conjunctival extranodal marginal zone B-cell lymphomas. And then just to emphasize also the point that you can get primary iridal lymphomas or lymphomas occurring in the iris. These tend to be very aggressive and the 12 or so that have been reported in the uh, literature, these patients have unfortunately developed disseminated disease from which they then um, succumbed. And finally, you can get the reverse happening. You can have patients who have systemic non-Hodgkin lymphoma, so something occurring in the, the gut or something occurring in lymph nodes elsewhere. And then it, during advanced disease, they then spread to the, to the eye. And for some reason or another, these lymphomas tend to occur in the choroid. And so you have a whole range. So this is an example of a CLL. Uh, arising uh, in the eye as a, uh, as a manifestation of advanced disease. Um, and these are just some clinical examples of secondary lymphomas in the choroid. Um, and just to highlight, this is a bizarre case where you have intravascular diffuse large cell beta lymphomas. This is uh, where you, the lymphomas, for some reason or another, proliferate and st stay predominantly within the blood vessels. So I know that was a whistle-stop tour. There is a, a summary that uh, we wrote up an, 10 years ago. I think it's still reasonably fresh. I mean, it probably does need an update, but um, I'll get around to that one day. Um, but I think it's uh, worth, worth a read. I guess a plea to the clinicians and the medical students uh, and uh, in, in the audience is that, you know, when you're suspecting uh, lymphoma in the eye that you... Do not put it in glutaraldehyde, which was perhaps practiced many years ago. That uh, you can actually put the biopsies in the tissue biopsies in uh, buffered formalin, and from that you can do a whole range of different molecular techniques. Um, if you've got fluid samples, so if you're doing a subretinal aspirate or you're doing a vitrectomy, then I would strongly suggest perhaps a softer fixative, uh, such as cytolite rather than formalin. Uh, and um, from there, you can also do all the molecular stuff. If you're thinking more of in, along the lines of an, an endophthalmitis, then uh, I would uh, suggest that you send that sample in fresh. But most importantly, speak to your pathologist we're really only a telephone call away or usually an email away. Please don't send the samples in on Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock. 
um, because those samples will probably sit on the bench until Monday morning and by that time these cells would have become quite necrotic and the chance of us getting anything out of it will not be very high. Um, so just to conclude, um, I, I would suggest, and I'm, I'm a pathologist so I would say it, um, morphology and immunophenotyping is, does uh, remain, I think, the gold standard in diagnosing intraocular lymphoma. Next generation sequencing is very much on the horizon, if not already in practice. Uh, we need to improve our therapies for the vitreoretinal lymphoma patients. They at the moment have very poor prognosis. And through the, the only way we can achieve that, because it's such a rare disease, is that we have concentrated um, efforts across Europe and uh, across the Atlantic. I'm just going to go on to this scene. You may recognize this. This is a beautiful sunset uh, over the river here, the Champilimo Foundation. And um, this was um, at the time of last year, in September, when I had the pleasure of attending the Champilimo Award giving uh, to, to Sight Savers and to the Christoffel Blind Mission, uh, who received the award here, first of all, uh, in Lisbon, and then received it at the annual AVO meeting in May. And it was a, an amazing ceremony. It was just so spectacular. Uh, the, the temperature was perfect. There was a float with the, the screen uh, out in the river. There was the president and the prime minister of Portugal here. And uh, I think what was also just incredible was that the president gave to Leonor Beleza, who's sitting here in the audience, the highest award that could have been given or can be given in Portugal, and this uh, was uh, when he took took her by surprise, I think, in giving that, and it was a, a very special moment. And I'd just like to say again, thank you very much for having us here, Leonor. Uh, for us, I think it's a, a special, a really special venue. Um, I've been encouraged strongly by Andre and Constanza to put one last slide in. And that I wouldn't have put in, but anyway, they filmed me at the lunch break because uh, I did, a, in a rash moment of insanity, um, I did a 320-mile cycle tour. Uh, so that's 500 kilometers if you're metric. Um, and I raised money for cancer research, um, a, a local charity called Northwest Cancer Research. And um, this charity, um, it has sponsored, it has been in existence for 70 years, and it has sponsored all types of cancer research, but it has also uh, contributed approximately a million over the years into uh, rare tumor types such as uveal melanoma. Um, I, the, um, I've been told to say that the Just Giving site is still open and will stay open until the end of July, should you feel that you'd like to donate. Well, thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions to the, the content of the lecture. Thank you.